This episode of the Gondrepreneur Podcast is brought to you by Canna Planners. Canna Planners is on a mission to normalize the emerging cannabis industry through beautiful design and professional web and marketing solutions. Whether you're looking to create a new cannabis brand, improve your packaging design, or get your company online, Canna Planners has the perfect solution. Your website is the window into your cannabis company. Make sure that you look awesome, that your messaging is on point, and that traffic converts to customers through SEO. From CBD companies to dispensaries and everything in between, Canna Planners has you covered. Visit them online today at cannaplanners.com for a free web demo. That's cannaplanners.com. Gondrepreneur is excited to announce the launch of our new YouTube series, The Fresh Cut, hosted by Kara Whitstock. Hi, I'm Kara Whitstock, host of The Fresh Cut by Gondrepreneur. In this interview series, we get straight to the source and speak with the real people working in the industry. In our first episode, I spend time with Nancy Southern, whose current mission is to educate seniors on cannabinoid medicine. She lets us know how to facilitate a comfortable retail setting for older adults and provides product recommendations directly from her own experience. Catch this in all future episodes on YouTube. Hey there, I'm your host, TG Brandfault, and thank you for listening to the Gontrepreneur.com podcast, where we try to bring you actionable information and normalize cannabis through the stories of gondrepreneurs, activists, and industry stakeholders. Today, I am joined by John McLeod. He's the co-founder for Michigan-based Cloud Cannabis Company, and he's a former police officer for the Detroit Police Department. Uh, So we have a lot of sort of issues to get through uh, in terms of your background as as a law enforcement uh, officer, as well as your role, you know, founding a cannabis company. Uh, But before we get into that, why don't you just briefly uh, tell people, you know, how you ended up in the space, you know, without going sort of into uh, too much detail. Yeah, right on. Uh, And thank you, TG. It's a it's a great pleasure to be on your show. And I appreciate the discussion and the ability to elaborate some on this. Uh, Cannabis for me as a business play really kind of paralleled my own um, medical play as a cannabis patient. Um, I was injured and, you know, was put on the opiate train. And I know we'll get get into this a little bit more uh, further on, but cannabis became medicine to me. And I had no experience with it prior to that. And it was really eye-opening. So what we wanted to do as a company is to help guide that experience for the future can of curious or people who are new to the uh, space or people that just need a natural healing alternative in these times. So the, the the way that we got connected was was you had you had reached out after we had published an article about a New York police uh, department officer who had, um, you know, been not denied medical cannabis after an on the job injury, um, and well, the email that we received from you was was that it made your blood boil. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about your reactions, the sort of visceral reaction that you had when you read that report? Yeah, I, absolutely, and and it 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 may, it still makes my blood boil that anyone would be denied the ability to naturally heal themselves of any ailment with cannabis. Um, the fact that this police officer was denied it um, just based off the simple fact that he was a police officer, I, I find just extraordinarily troublesome because I know as a former police officer, I could go to work hopped up on opiates. Um, and it be completely acceptable and normalized and, um, you know, run of the mill. No one would think twice about it, but someone who used a very low dose medicine, um, uh, cannabis would be looked at considerably different. And I, and I think the hypocrisy of it is just disgusting. So I, 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 I appreciate you reaching out because it's, it's very rare. You know, we had a little discussion before we went live that, 
you know, people in this industry have the opportunity to have these open discussions with law enforcement or even former law enforcement. And so I want to talk to you just a little bit about that. And, and um, you know, when you were a law enforcement officer in Detroit, and, and I mean, people who listen to the show know I lived in Detroit for a year. I loved that city, um, you know, but I'm also was keenly aware while I was there about sort of the racial disparity in arrest, and especially when it comes to to cannabis. I mean, it's a predominantly black city. Um you know, what was your opinion uh, about cannabis while you were an active duty police officer? Yeah, so I, I'm born and raised in the city of Detroit. Um, I'm a Detroit public school kid. So being a police officer in Detroit was a decision that I made very, very early on in life. And I don't talk about this much, TG, but I was in seventh grade, the middle of the day, walking home from my school bus when I was the victim of a violent robbery for my winter coat. Now as if that wasn't traumatic enough for a seventh grader, when the police officers arrived at my home later that evening to take the report, they were extraordinarily disrespectful, very, very condescending and not helpful in the least. So for me at that very tender age, I learned two things. One, I gotta watch my back a little bit better. <laughs> and two, I wanted to become a police officer because I never wanted anyone to feel the way that I felt at that moment. And so for me, it was, that's the way I approach policing. That my approach was to be a healer, to be a helper, to be someone that was never gonna put a, a, a barely teenage child in that type of position, right? So I was fortunate enough to become a police officer in Detroit. It, it was um, one of the best jobs I ever had. I worked with some of the finest people that I've ever met. Um, but cannabis in Detroit is not really uh, a huge uh, focus of a lot of the attention, particularly of the patrol officers uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, Detroit has certainly had its challenges over the years and had some comebacks and some downfalls, but it's a gritty city. It's a city I love, and it's a city uh, full of just really unbelievable people, you know, great people. Yeah. But the police department does not really, like, we never really went after weed, so to speak. You know, it was never really a focus that I was ever around. You know, when I was preparing for this, I was kind of going through and I'm thinking, I don't, I don't really recall arresting anyone for cannabis. And I, really? and, and it's, it's the same thing. Like I never wrote a single speeding ticket, you know, I mean, those things that those functions that I think most police officers do on a day-to-day -day basis, maybe it's because I was in Detroit. So we had other things to do. Yeah. Um, that it wasn't a focus of ours, but it was never anything that I really, that I ever dealt with, um, to be honest with you. So, um, I, I would say the challenge is, is just a basic understanding that the laws are the laws and the police officers do not write the laws. They're just there to enforce the laws. So just understanding that there is a difference between the two. And in 2008, in the state of Michigan, there was a medical marijuana law that was passed and that changed everything in Michigan. I think it changed everything on a policing standpoint too in Michigan, because now we're in, fast forward in 2016, you have an adult use law that comes on the books. So we're a full adult use state in Michigan and you know we're getting to be a, a relatively mature market at this point in time. Cannabis is not a thing you know, anymore here. I mean, it's, you know, I have friends that are still on the job and one of them who is a canine officer who actually got to bring his dog home because he cannot use it in service anymore because it's trained to detect cannabis. And so therefore they can't use that dog anymore. So there's a whole, there's a whole piece of evolution with the policing industry that has come along with cannabis as well. Um, but I think it's a unique perspective that I bring to the table to understand that, listen, this is a legal industry now. This is an industry that we should embrace. And this is an industry that does a lot of good both in people's lives and in communities that have been historically uh, disproportionately affected by cannabis prohibition. When you look at these communities that uh, in Michigan that are benefiting from cannabis businesses, cannabis investment, and cannabis jobs, which I think is probably the biggest benefactor in all of the industry is how many good paying jobs are created. A lot of these um, are, are centered in communities that were otherwise not desirable investments to a traditional business. And the cannabis industry has been able to come in and revitalize huge industrial buildings 
or run down retail locations or invest in pockets of neighborhoods or communities that otherwise would not get investment and certainly would not get the amount of jobs that come from this industry. So there's there's so much benefits to it. And, and a lot of that benefit goes to a safer community with cameras and lights and visibility and walkability. And, and all of that stuff helps the police do their job, which is enforce the laws, which, you know, is what they're intended to do. So as a, as a native Detroiter, you know, what's your sort of take on, uh, you know, the, the push for social equity in, you know, the cannabis space, cannabis space in general, and, you know, specifically are, do you think that they're doing enough, uh, regulators are doing enough, lawmakers are doing enough in uh, Michigan uh, to, to help uh, those, those communities that were most affected by prohibition? Yeah, I think it's, are they, is anyone doing enough? Probably not, right? <laughs> you know, true. I mean, let's be honest. Um, are they trying really, really hard? I believe so. Um, you know, there's a couple of examples. Uh, you know, our own regulatory body in Lansing is, is headed up by a man by the name of uh, Director Brisbo, Andrew Brisbo. And he has set a tone for social equity in the state of Michigan, which I find is very, very loud. I mean, he's letting it known that this is something that's going to happen here. Um, they're pushing it very strong from a regulatory perspective. And then at the municipal level, you have people like Councilman James Tate in the city of Detroit, who has rolled out a program which I think establishes legacy applicants and social equity, which potentially is second to none in the industry. So. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunities to do better. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunities to be more inclusive. And, and, I, and I, I know from Cloud's perspective, we're constantly evaluating and looking at all opportunities to do so. Um, but from a regulatory perspective in Michigan, I think we've been very, very progressive the way our cannabis legislation has been rolled out. And I, and I think the intent is to do the same thing with social equity. Well, I mean, you've you've you have such a unique perspective on the industry regarding your background. So, so I want to just ask about your unique perspective, sort of with your experience with opioids and your journey to medical cannabis. Yeah, so I kind of uh, alluded to it before, but uh, um, I was a police officer, loved my job. Um, running down the alley one day, next thing I know, I tear my ACL, my MCL, and I'm just a hobbling mess. So. After several surgeries, the uh, police department, um, you know, retired me out. Said, you know, you're, you're, you're on opiates the rest of your life, and uh, you know, here's your doctor's number, and this is pretty much how it goes. Wow. Um, so, you know, my wife and I tend to be more natural, more healing people. You know, we're yogis. We're trying to do the right thing. You know, and uh, so we struggled with that quite a bit. And I started off with very low dose uh, pills. And eventually, you know, moved up to a patch, a uh, low dose, a long release opiate patch. So um, it just wasn't working for me. And I was unaware. And one day my wife sat me down and said, look, it's changing who you are. Um, you know, you're not the best husband you could be. You're not the best father you can be. Um, I, I think, quite frankly, she was just telling me I wasn't the best human I could be. And... But for that conversation, I was unaware how the opiates were changing me as a person. And I was on a very low dose, you know, very, very low dose. Yeah. Um, so at that point in time, we said, this has to change. So I had a conversation with a good friend of mine who's a medical cannabis provider in the state of Michigan. Um, he writes recommendations. He's on the forefront of the industry, really just an un unbelievable guy. And um, he was ready for me to come see him. He was ready for me to experience the healing benefits of cannabis. And, uh, you know, when I finally tried it for the first time, TG, it was like flipping a switch. It, it was unbelievable how I was able to heal myself naturally with no side effects and with nothing synthetic putting into my body. And it was a game changer for me. It was an eye opener for me. I had no previous cannabis experience. So for me, I was hesitant to even begin, but it, it was my transformation was instantaneous and that really sparked my interest in in spreading that word to the masses because i think there's a stigma that we're fighting against first and foremost but i think there's an information gap in most people's visibility when it comes to cannabis 
And we really try to strive to fill that gap for people. So tell me about, about filling that gap for people. You're somebody who had no experience who, you know, started medicating with cannabis. That was your real, your entry into it. Um, so, so tell me how you use sort of that experience uh, to help educate uh, people. That, that, that Yeah. Well, you know, sorry to cut you off. It's a great question. I listen on, on your November 19 podcast, you're talking to Sean Gold. So it's, <laughs> it's a great podcast, by the way, I, I would you. recommend everyone listen to it if they haven't, but, he said a quote that really stuck with me. I had to write it down. He said, cannabis for him is like a second opinion. And it was, it really stuck with me when he said that, because for me, I kind of felt like I was living a certain type of life. I thought that I was on a path and I couldn't deviate from it. And little did I know cannabis was waiting there for me as that second opinion as saying, no, look, this is not the path you're supposed to be on. You can live a better life. You can live higher as we like to say you can live the best version of yourself, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, for me, being able just to explain that to people and, and you know, to come at them as just a, a someone who had no cannabis experience, someone who had a law enforcement background, who was very, you know, by the books, this is the way it is. Cannabis is not some deviation from that. It's not. It's a tool to healing that naturally occurs in our world that's here for us. And just explaining to people that it's not, you know, the cookie that your uncle gave you at the holiday party where you, you know, were high for a couple of days. That's not <laughs> what we're talking about here. You know, that's fun. And everyone yeah. has a good time with that. And it's a great story. But what we're talking about is regulated, tested product, product that you can, you know, what's in it and what's not in it. More importantly, product that you can, you know, know your dosage amounts so that you can properly microdose yourself into where you get to that position where you're healed or you get to that position where you're whatever you're trying to go for so that cannabis can be the best tool to help you live the best version of your life. So I, ju I just got to ask, I mean, you've, you've obviously become very, very passionate, not just about the, the, the industry, but I mean, the healing benefits of cannabis. Can, can I just ask, what, what is the reaction to your sort of, uh, you know, your, your second act, if you will, from your, your previous colleagues in law enforcement or, or, or people like that? I mean, are they surprised at where you've ended up? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'll be, I'll be honest with you. I'm surprised too. Listen, I'm, I'm very fortunate that I was able to have access to the people in a state that had laws that protected me as a patient that allowed me to make this progression into cannabis. Um, I think of the people that live in states that don't even have a medical program in this country and, and the lengths that they have to go to, to just heal themselves naturally. So I think there's a lot of surprise, but I also think that the story is real. The healing is real. So regardless of the background or the order, it's the information is just, it's truth. And speaking that to whoever will listen to it is really what I feel like my responsibility is not only to this company, but to the industry as a whole, because we can be stewards of this industry. This is something that you know, we live day to day. You live this every single day and have for a very, very long time. But for the majority of the of the mass public, this is the front end of this. This is just the beginning of the cannabis movement in the United States of America. So really to be the right uh, ambassadors of the industry to the general public, I think is a huge, a huge piece of this. So, so tell me a bit about, about building your brand. Um, one of the things I found really interesting, I read an interview with you and you said, quote, to be taken seriously, you have to be in Ann Arbor, end quote. So, so obviously, you know, you, you're, you're building your brand sort of around this, this idea of being taken seriously by the right people. Um, so, so why don't you first tell me, you know, sort of about the, the building your brand. And then I want to ask you a question about Ann Arbor. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, for we really have tried to build a brand that's very inclusive to all. It's very open, very cheerful, very accepting. Um, I've been fortunate to, um, you know, build this brand with some of the finest business minds um, that you'll ever meet. And these just happen to be good friends of mine. You know, this is a family business. We built this ourselves. You know, we bootstrapped it all ourselves. This is something that we did because we feel like we have a better 
approach to the cannabis industry. We feel like we have the right uh, education-minded approach to the cannabis industry, and and we have some really great people. I mean, you know, one of my partners is one of the finest extractors, you know, in Michigan with a great brand, and you know, the business acumen on the on the top end is just unbelievable. And and we've been able to forge a hole in the space that's allowed us to establish cloud as an accessible kind brand. And that's what we look to grow. And, you know, we have a couple locations open and operating the state and we have big plans, you know, for next year. So, so, and, and I want to go back to Ann Arbor just a little bit. You know, for most people, I mean, again, I lived in Michigan. I loved Ann Arbor. I spent a ton of money on records in Ann Arbor. I had a great time in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, explain briefly the culture of, of Ann Arbor and, and why you feel the need to be there in order to be, in your own words, taken seriously. Yeah, so as I said, born and raised in Detroit, the unique thing about Metro Detroit in particular or Ann Arbor's uh, you know, proximity to Detroit is born and raised in Detroit, but 25 minutes down the road from Ann Arbor, which is, you know, this beacon on the hill when it comes to cannabis, right? So I remember growing up, going and walking around the Diag and just hanging out and feeling like we were cool as teenagers in Ann Arbor, you know, and, and understanding that it was very progressive when it came to cannabis and really embracing that. I, my senior year government paper was on the legalization of marijuana, you know, Seriously. so I, yeah, so listen, I'll be honest with you, I was very, very proud of my, you know, teenage self at that point in time, because I went from writing that paper, which I got an A in that paper, thank you, Mr. Dean, shout out to Mr. <laughs> Dean on that, but, uh, but then I went right into law enforcement right thereafter. So my, you know, my thoughts on cannabis were certainly, I guess, probably a little bit more progressive than most at that time. But when I think of Ann Arbor, I mean, think about it. Uh, the pioneers that came out of Ann Arbor and cannabis, you know, are too, too numerous to tell, but John Lennon did a concert for John Sinclair in Ann Arbor. I mean, this is John Lennon we're talking about here. Wow. You know what I'm saying? And this is, this is someone who John Sinclair was incarcerated for having two marijuana joints and he got 10 years and there was a whole movement behind that and a big concert that John Lennon put together. And, you know, I mean, this is, this is how far Ann Arbor is ahead of the rest of the, you know, certainly the rest of the state, but probably the rest of the country when it comes to cannabis. I mean, this was 50 years ago. Yeah. So for me, I felt like it, it, we couldn't really have a cannabis brand until we were in Ann Arbor. And, and, and that's just because that is the epicenter, period. So, so I mean, another really interesting part about uh your your brand your philosophy and, and this was something i didn't realize until uh, you know we started talking at the beginning uh before we went live again and you know i had said you know i'd gone through your intro and you're like hey, get rid of that that chief position he's like we, we've sort of you said you know we've we've decided to sort of get rid of these sweet see sweet titles and you're the second cannabis business uh entrepreneur that i've spoken to uh, in the last two uh, two episodes that is that has said this sort of shift by independent operators to get rid of these C-suite titles. What's your impetus uh, sort of behind that move? I think it, it just having a more welcoming and opening environment. I mean, for us, we are only, me as a co-founder or whatever position I hold within the company, I'm only as good as the patient advocate or the bud tender that's coming to see you when you pull up at one of our stores. If you have a bad experience with that person, your reflection of my company is going to be that. So it's a more collaborative effort. It's a more collaborative approach to the way we handle business. We're about putting the right person in the right seat and making sure they have the tools to do their job successfully and then getting the hell out of the way and letting <laughs> them do what they have to do. You know, there's a reason why you put people where you put them. And we're not a company that's um, afraid of making mistakes or doing something wrong. we firmly believe that you cannot grow without making mistakes. You cannot grow without doing the wrong thing one way or another. As long as your mind and heart is in the right place, we'll figure it out. It's that second mistake that, you know, that you got to watch out for, right? But we want to be a collaborative company. We want to be a company that's all about acceptance and growth and kindness. And that's the way we started this. Like I say, it's a family company. It really is. I mean, it's your a name, family Your name's company. on it. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Ironically so, but it but it's a family company from top to bottom. And and some of the finest people you've ever met 
um, you know, started this company with me and, and, and I feel very fortunate to be a small part of it. So what, what do you, you know, as the co-founder of a cannabis business, what do you look for in sort of the right person? Um, you know, let's say for, for sort of a liaison to management position or, or, you know, somebody who has a little bit of power, but you know, isn't you right. What, what do you look for? What, what, what personality well, traits? It's the motor city. So first and foremost, the one word you will always hear before we talk to anyone is do they hustle? That's it. You got to hustle. The cannabis industry is not a nine to five Monday through Friday industry. It's not. It's an ever evolving, ever changing industry that's not for the faints of heart. So we're looking for someone who has hustle and then someone who matches our core values, someone who's respectful, someone who's responsible, someone who's accessible, you know, and someone who fosters um, good relationships, both in their business and their personal life. You know, you got to have good balance, too to be good at your job. Um, so that's really what we look for. But, you know, if there's no one, you know, of us founders that are above getting that phone call at one o'clock in the morning, I didn't say three o'clock in the morning or five <laughs> o'clock in the morning or, you know, 10 o'clock at night on a Sunday. I mean, those are calls we take actively every single day, you know, and I hope that never changes. You know, I really do. I hope that never changes, but we would certainly require that amount of dedication from anyone that was associated with the cloud. And and so, so what are, as, as a small operator, what are some of the challenges for you uh, with regard to Michigan's industry? And at the same time, what have regulators gotten right? Yeah. Um, and I, and I'll preface this by saying small operator now, um, you know, we're, <laughs> we're open in Ann Arbor, we're open in Muskegon Township, we're soon to be open in Traverse City, and then we got a, we got a good slate of stores next year for you that, uh, I mean, are really I mean, going to be you're, you're not a, you're not a cure leaf, you know? You're... No, that's true. That's true. Um, you know, I guess for us, the biggest thing has just been working between the regulatory changes, you know, um, it, the 2016 voter initiative that it, uh, you know, legalize adult use cannabis in Michigan is not perfect. Um, it's better than nothing. Don't get me wrong. And I'm very fortunate to be working in a space that has that. But there are some challenges that come along with it. There's some pitfalls, both at the municipal level, but also at the state level, too. So just, you know, managing those, that's certainly a challenge. Um, as far as, you know, I, I think the regulatory body in Michigan has really done uh, just an amazing job with the whole rollout of cannabis legalization. Um, I think they've been supported, um, you know, by their staff and and certainly by the population of the state of Michigan. I mean, we're a very pro-cannabis state and the regulations that they've rolled out have been progressive and have been open. And, uh, you know, as we go on, you know, I hope that continues to be the case, you know. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, not not for nothing. I mean, a lot of the early operators, you know, they they were operating in sort of a gray area for so long that I think that regulators themselves had a bit of challenge, you know, just giving them a little bit of credit over there in Michigan. Um, I, I love asking owners, you know, especially those who who work in, with both patients and rec users, um, what products are most popular at your dispensaries? Yeah, it's a great question. Um... So I think we've seen it's almost regional, you know, what plays in Muskegon Township, which is in the, you know, a little more Northern West Michigan uh, than what plays in Ann Arbor is a little bit different. So certainly we're a leaf heavy state and cloud cannabis prides ourselves on our selection of leaf. Uh, you know, this is where it all started. You know, we have what you need at cloud. There's for sure. There's for sure on the leaf end, no question about it. So, I mean, that's certainly what our KPIs are telling us is that we're a very bulk leaf heavy um, state. You know, uh, there's some new products that are coming to market, particularly in the edible um, end of things. Uh, a Canico out of California is coming to Michigan here shortly, and they're bringing a product that is uh, not seen in Michigan thus far. So we're really excited about that launch. Um, you know, Mitten Extracts is putting out some really, really great extracts, some unbelievable concentrates. And those seem to go really well at the store level as well. So it, it, it just kind of is individual um, based. And that's where we try to help because, you know, I can't tell you how many times I'll have someone come to the store 
or find me in a grocery store or what have you. And we'll, we'll talk about, you know, what they're trying to treat or what they're looking to accomplish. And these are kind of curious people. I mean, in the state of Michigan, we're just shy of 300,000 registered medical patients in the state of Michigan. You know, we've been, we've had a medical loss since 2008. So it's quite robust. Now those numbers are going down now a little bit since adult use came into play, but not as, not as, not as quickly as people thought. But we have 6.1 qualifying adult use customers. That's a lot of people that know nothing about cannabis. And I know that experience quite intimately well yeah. from my evolution with cannabis. So for me, really bridging that gap, explaining the uses, because I know people that can smoke leaf all day long, but they take a five milligram edible and they're done. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> done. So, uh, so it really is. It's very individual because you can't say, oh, you can handle this bong riff or something. So you can't handle a two, uh, 2.5 milligram, you know, peppermint. Um, so really just explaining or understanding what someone is trying to accomplish, understanding what their end goal is, and then, you know, curtailing the product to that. That's really the piece that's important. So what, what question do you get asked most often from can of curious people? And, and what is your answer to them? Yeah, what can I do to help me sleep? No one sleeps. Really? No one sleeps. And, you know, uh, the doctor I referenced earlier, he always tells people, he says, you know, there's, there's 200, let's say 300,000 registered patients, but there are a lot of people in the adult use space that use cannabis medicinally. Otherwise, if it weren't cannabis, we would call it medicine, right? Yeah. You know, so... There's people that don't have their medicinal card that use cannabis medicinally. And, and a large majority of those are people that just don't sleep well. You know, so if somebody comes to me with an, you know, a complaint of not sleeping well, I would suggest probably a low dose, a low dose gummy 45 minutes before bedtime and then come back. Let's see. It's a trial and error process, right? You know, we try to approach from a micro dosing level where you're going to start low and move your way up. That way you can kind of be in control of that experience, you know? The last thing we want anyone to do is to be overdosed, to be too high, not have a good experience, and then turn their back on cannabis. Because not only have we lost someone who will never experience the true healing of cannabis, but we've probably changed their mind to where they're going to look at the space differently. They're going to talk about the space differently. And that's the bigger loss, I think, because then you're not really representing the industry and the plant in its best light. So th th this whole conversation, you, like people don't see the video. We, we use the video, but you've been smiling. I mean, you, this, this whole conversation. It, so uh, this might be a tough question for you, but what is the best part about the space for John McLeod? Uh, <laughs> wow. That is a tough question. It's a tough question. Um, you know, I, I think for me, probably the best thing is, is that, um, I know that cannabis saved my life, period. I know that I would not be anywhere near the person that I am today if it weren't for cannabis. So for me, being able to speak on that, being able to explain my experience and being able to inform people is, a, is a, I feel very fortunate every single day to be able to do that. And you know, listen, my job, I, I get to talk about cannabis with cool people like you, man. So it's like, what's not to love about it? You know, and we're doing some really great things as a company. I mean, we're doing some really good charitable uh, commitments. I mean, we got this really good thing going with women veterans in Muskegon this weekend that we're really excited about. We're partnered with the Humane Society of Washtenaw County helping homeless animals in Ann Arbor. So you know, I get to be part of that too, which is just, you know, the giving back, the, um, the talking about, and just the, just the information piece for me with cannabis. It's, I'm so fortunate, just so fortunate, man. I mean, I, I really appreciate your candor throughout this, this whole, you know, conversation um, because, you know, a lot of guys, a lot of people, you know, they'll come up, they'll come on here and, and, you know, you can tell the underpinning is more, you know, trying to, I don't know, sort of self, uh, you know, 
to sort of create a bigger deal about themselves than they are. And and with you, I mean, I think that, that, that you're you're keenly aware of the unique position that that you're in, and and you know to to see the joy you know and to hear the sort of joy uh that that, that you put off um it's 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 heartwarming man i mean it really it really is and i'm not a guy whose heart is warmed easily um but i want i i, I you know we're getting ready to wrap this up here and I, and I gotta ask you what advice do you have for entrepreneurs uh who are looking to enter the cannabis space I would say, and thank you for those kind words, TJ. I appreciate it. Um, but I, I would certainly say, um, just trust yourself. You know, trust yourself. Bet on yourself. Um, I, you know, I think that you know, I believe in luck, but I also think you make your own luck. You know what I mean? I think you just work hard. Um, if you're dedicated to whatever you're trying to do, I, I think that's the key to success. But um, you just got to start. You know, um, you don't, I, I wrote down a quote, you know, five years ago when we really started trying to look at this as, you know, something we could provide value to the industry with. And um, it's a Zig Ziglar quote. And he says, you don't have to be great to start, but you got to start to be great. And, and, and that would be my advice is, you know, you're never going to get there if you don't take that first step. I think that's that's really really great advice. Um, so, do you, where where can people find out more about Cloud Cannabis Company and and maybe find out uh, more about you? Social media websites. Yeah, so uh, cloudcannabis.com is going to be your one stop shop for all reference to Cloud Cannabis. Uh, you'll be able to get locations. You'll be able to get online menus. Um, there's some really cool interactive stuff when it comes to, you know, strain specific or picking a strain for a consumer that's cannabis curious. You know, we have an option where it gives you like pictures where you just click on a picture and it tells you that's what you, and then it'll show you which strand works best for you. So there's some really great resources on the website. That would be the one-stop shop. And then if you're in the Muskegon area, come see us, uh, in Muskegon Township or Ann Arbor and soon to be in Traverse City and a uh, town near you. <laughs> well, it'll be it'll it'll be 2022 before you can come to a town near me. But uh, you know, I, I I I do plan once this pandemic is over to go back to Detroit again. I love and miss that city. Um, and, you know, so so hopefully once everything calms down and, and I can you know drive out there again, you know, I'd I'd love to link up with you and 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 you know in, enjoy your home city uh, with you because I think it'd be an incredible experience, man. And I really appreciate you, you know, coming on the show. Um, you know, you're you're a wealth of of knowledge and and excitement, um, and. You know, I, I didn't really know what to expect when, you know, I get an email and it's like, hey, here, here's a former cop, um, <laughs> you know, so, so uh, you, you've, you've sort of surprised me a little bit. And I, and I really appreciate you, you know, coming on the show again. Well, and I, and I appreciate the platform and the ability to talk. And, you know, as I stated before, it's a, it's a great pleasure of mine to be on your podcast. Uh, I'm a you know, regular listener and a, and a huge fan of you. So this is this is really my pleasure. Thank you. That's John McLeod. He's the co-founder for Michigan-based Cloud Cannabis Company. He's a former police officer for the Detroit Police Department, and he's a, he's a hell of a nice guy. Uh, you can find more episodes of the Gontrepreneur.com podcast in the podcast section of Gontrepreneur.com on Spotify uh, and in the Apple iTunes store. On the Gontrepreneur.com website, you'll find the latest cannabis news and cannabis jobs updated daily, along with transcripts of this podcast. You can also download the Gontrepreneur.com app in iTunes and Google Play. This episode was engineered by Trim Media House. I've been your host, TG Brandfault.